since that first Christmas day in the stable at Bethlehem. Hers has been a rags to riches story. From humble beginnings as a peasant girl, she has been raised to the status of international superstar. She's the center of a multi-million pound pilgrimage industry, the darling of musicians and writers, the most painted lady in history, a powerful role model for women. And for her true fans, she is the greatest Christian that ever lived. She has never lost the knack of pulling in the crowds. Even on the streets of London, the faithful are out marching for Mary because they believe that they will have a closer relationship with Jesus by loving his mother. But she doesn't always get a smooth ride. Mary was a sinner supposed to be able to save people. There are other Christians who believe equally passionately that Mary obstructs her son by enticing people to worship her. That gentle Mary should inspire such strong passions is startling because in the Bible she has little more than a walk-on part. Her only starring moment happens in the Christmas stories. The only way I can understand Christmas is to think of it as the that God deals with us through a human being and that that is Jesus and that to be a human being you need a mother and that um, that's the importance of the Virgin Mary, is that Jesus had a real mother, so he was a real human being. The whole creation is redeemed through God becoming man, and it's through the mother of God that God was able to become man. If she had said no to Gabriel, said, no, I'm not going to have 
God conceived in me, then the incarnation wouldn't have happened in her. So our salvation comes from Christ, but without Mary saying yes, then salvation wouldn't have come into the world. So we worship Christ alone because he is God, but we venerate and honor the mother of God because she allowed God to become man in her. Every Christmas, one of the nuns at the Convent of the Poor Clares in Wales is chosen to play the part of Mary, the Virgin Mother of God. The nuns' lives of humble obedience to God's will echo the qualities most associated with Mary as a mother. All of us like to think that somewhere there's a mother like Mary who is different from our real mothers, who really did put her children, put her child first and who wasn't occupied in pursuing questions of her own identity or even in a relationship with, with one's father. So that, in a sense, you know, we're all bound up in this kind of notion, this, this unrealistic notion of, of a mother like her. Clearly she is a blank canvas that people all over the place have, have, have used to project onto. Um, if one reads the text, she's a, a very, very ordinary woman. But, as this 1906 film records, an ordinary Jewish woman to whom extraordinary things happened. The most amazing of which was the visit of the Archangel Gabriel. He came to ask Mary whether she would consent to be the mother of God. Though only described in one gospel, St. Luke, the Annunciation by the Angel is the most important moment in the history of Mary. said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shalt bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob for ever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee, and therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Mary said, Behold the handmaiden of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Luke implies in his gospel that Mary could have refused to be the mother of Jesus. It is her acceptance which lies at the heart of the cult of Mary, for without her yes, there could have been no Christianity. The obedience of Mary which brings salvation back to the world contrasts with Eve's disobedience in the Garden of Eden. As Mary's cult developed, she became known as the New Eve because she accepted God's will. In art, the Annunciation is the most celebrated event of her life. For painters all the way through the Western tradition, the Annunciation is not only an event which happened once, which you can represent. 
It's also the great moment of moral choice, which continues for everybody. It's one of the central points of the Annunciation, that the Virgin has to decide whether or not she will take part. The, the whole of the epic of salvation depends on her agreeing to cooperate. And from quite an early point, this is seen as the choice that every Christian has to make. Will they cooperate? Will they play their part? And in the gallery, there is, I think, what is the supreme example of this view of the Annunciation as the moral choice of every Christian soul. It's painted by Nicholas Poussin in Rome in 1657. What you're being asked to do is to meditate on the particular choice that the Virgin had to make. The angel is pointing very clearly uh, to the dove of the Holy Ghost. And the way Poussin has demonstrated the divine intention through the pointing of the angel and the human acceptance through Mary's right hand held out towards us is, I think, quite clearly intended as a visual meditation on that moment of choice, the choice that everybody has to make. God came to Mary and made an outrageous demand, and without question, she obeyed. And I think that's a wonderful inspiration and a wonderful example to us as Christians, because it is my firm belief that Christianity is 95% obedient. 95% getting on with the job. Forty, please. I've got a right, Shane. You're an example for <laughs> Mary's example has led Jack Burton to give up his full-time ministry to get on with the more down-to-earth job of driving buses in Norwich. He believes that that is the best way he can be a Christian disciple. For me, Mary is the most perfect portrayal in the history of the church, probably, of what being a follower of her son involves. Jesus spoke a great deal about the kingdom of God, and in the kingdom which Jesus spoke about, it isn't the great and the powerful and the megastars who count first. It is people like Mary. It is the obedient, the humble, the meek, the simple, the lowly. And certainly in the Magnificat, she makes it very clear, I think, what the integral features of Christian discipleship are all about. Castle Meadow. The Magnificat is the great song Mary sings after consenting to be the bearer of God's Son. She rejoices in God her Saviour, who has chosen a lowly handmaiden to play such an important part in salvation. Through her, God will fulfill his promises, and just as he has magnified her, so he will exalt the humble and meek, in preference to the mighty, whom he will put down from their seats, and the rich, whom he will send empty away. It's a very fierce poem. It's not merely that the poor are going to get fed, which is quite nice and quite common, but the rich are going to be hungry. <laughs> and there is, I suppose, the epitome that not that I wish anyone to be hungry in the direct sense of the word, but it, it does more than say everything will be nice and the lamb will lie down with the lamb. It is actually a poem about justice and about um, God's commitment through her to, to justice. So I love the last lines there, you know, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever, you know, that no matter what happens really, that we will come slon, as we say in Irish, that we will come healthy out of life, that, you know, maybe things will be, will, will be um, difficult and sometimes disastrous and, uh, and no hope would seem to be there, that in the end it's a tremendous sound of salvation. He who has cast down the mighty form of the thorns and has raised up the Lord, he, he. Oh, he 
St. Luke's Gospel does Mary play such a dramatic part in the early stories of Christianity. In St. Matthew, she is there to receive the gifts of the wise men, but she stays silent throughout, and it is her husband Joseph who makes all the decisions. In the other two Gospels, there are no references to any of the events surrounding Jesus' miraculous birth, and in St. John, she is not even referred to by name. St. Mark also makes Mary play a different role from that of devoted mother. The earliest gospel is Mark, and it has references to the Virgin Mary. And it's interesting the way in which the Virgin Mary is referred to in Mark. For example, she's not referred to as the Virgin. Um, she's referred to simply as the mother of Jesus. And she has other children, and we're given their names, James and Juices and so on, and sisters. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. In Mark, the, the way in which she's referred to, and that the brothers and sisters are referred to, suggests that they are unbelievers. Now this is typical of Mark, who wants to emphasize that Jesus is the only person who is right, and everybody else is wrong, including the disciples and the women and so on. It's difficult to know why Mary achieves such prominence, why she's so important a figure now, um, given that she is not the focus of, of the Gospels at all. Um, I mean, one can look at it from a sort of feminist viewpoint, I suppose, and say she produces the, the feminine aspect to a religion that maybe got rather over-masculine in places. The need for a feminine faith. The early church reacted to the popular demand from its pagan converts to boost the role of Mary. For cultures used to strong fertility goddesses, docile Mary in her little house in Nazareth was not enough. They wanted a more powerful mother figure. Uh, as Christianity developed, uh, uh, and its Mariological vision expanded, uh, it absorbs many images from the goddesses of the Mediterranean world. And a very important figure is the figure of Isis, who is the Egyptian goddess, but she was a popular goddess throughout uh, the Mediterranean world at that period. And you have a very powerful image of her seated as queen, on a, on a throne with the, the, the baby Horus, who is the new god king, on her lap. The art of the early church mirrored the imagery of the pagan goddesses, and in its icons, the figure of the mother began to dwarf the god king. These images reflect the struggle the church was having to keep Mary in proportion to her son. As the desire grew to turn Mary into a goddess, the icon painters had to ensure that the focus of their work remained Christ and not his mother. Brother Aidan, a Greek Orthodox monk, has devoted his life to preserving these religious traditions of iconography. The iconographer takes egg, the painter's made of egg, from the animal kingdom. He takes a pigment from the mineral kingdom. He takes wood, the icon is painted on wood, from the vegetable kingdom. And all these are brought together through the praying iconographer who is representing the whole church and makes these good things into something very good. The iconography virtually always has her with Christ, precisely because the crown of her life is 
the fact that she bore Christ. So our love for her is never separated from our love for Christ. We honor her in her obedience, uh, but we honor her primarily as the means by which Christ has become man. The way Mary's claim to fame is that she provided Jesus Christ with his humanity as an ordinary earthly mother. Her fans wanted her to be a more glamorous cult figure. To make her a more suitable mother for God, they crowned her Queen of Heaven. They removed Jesus' brothers and sisters and turned them into cousins and declared that Mary had always and always would be a virgin. They gave her parents, Anna and Joachim, the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception was developed within the Catholic Church to explain that she uniquely was born without the taint of original sin. A second teaching, the doctrine of the Assumption, pronounced that as a reward for being the perfectly flawless woman, she had been spared death and instead had been taken bodily into heaven and seated higher than all the angels. The simple peasant girl was showered with titles, 49 of which and recorded in this litany of Loretto. Holy Mary, Holy Mother of God, Holy Virgin of Virgins, Mother of Christ, Mother of Divine Grace, Mother Most Pure, Mother Most Chaste, Mother Inviolate, Mother Undefiled, Mother Most Lovable, Mother Most Admirable, Mother of Good Counsel, Mother of our Creator, Mother of our Saviour, Virgin Most Prudent, Virgin Most Venerable, Virgin Most Renowned, Virgin Most Powerful, Virgin Most Merciful, Virgin Most Faithful, Mirror of Justice, Seat of Wisdom, Cause of our Joy, Spiritual Vessel, Vessel of Honour, Singular Vessel of Devotion, Mystical Rose, Tower of David, Tower of Ivory, House of Gold, Ark of the Covenant, Gate of Heaven, Morning Star, Health of the Sick, Refuge of Sinners, Comfort of the Afflicted, Help of Christians, Queen of Angels, Queen of Patriarchs, Queen of Prophets, Queen of Apostles, Queen of Martyrs, Queen of Confessors, Queen of Virgins, Queen of All Saints, Queen Conceived Without Original Sin, Queen Assumed into Heaven, Queen of the Most Holy Rosary, Queen of Peace. Ave Maria. Although Mary was famous because of her son, Jesus, once she had been crowned Queen of Heaven, she took on an importance of her own. The Church has resisted the idea of her being anything more than the perfect human, but she inspires such extremes of devotion that it's sometimes difficult to tell whether her followers understand that she is not a goddess. At the height of the pilgrimage season, over a million devotees flock to Mary's shrine at Fatima in Portugal, many of them choosing to make the last part of the journey on their knees as a penance to Mary. When the Virgin Mary appeared here to three children in 1917, she commanded that a shrine should be built to commemorate her visit. She also brought a message from heaven that the world should be re-consecrated to her Immaculate Heart and that the Rosary, prayer she had given the Catholic Church in another vision, should be said every day. Rosary crusades happen all over the world when groups of the faithful gather to proclaim their love of Mary and to do as she instructed at Fatima. We are here today to witness against this abominable idolatry. We counted an offense that such things should be happening in a country that's known the Reformation. But there are some who think that Mary has been given a position she doesn't deserve. The Bible says quite clearly that no one comes to the Father except through the Son. There's no mention of the Mother in the process of salvation. Which is 
be forbidden in the word of God. In the minds of staunch Protestants, there's no doubt that Mary has been turned into a goddess by her followers. This is why she has become the focus of so much Christian antagonism. We've come because we heard that what we call idolatry, and class as idolatry, the public display of an image of the Virgin Mary, is a, is a gross offence to us personally, and we dare say that it is an offence to us because it's an offence to God. Mary has no role uh, apart. She's a sinner the same as we are. And Christ died for her sins the same as he died for ours. The Bible warns against idolatry. It says, flee idolatry. Turn from your idols. And this is sending these people to hell, believing in idolatry. You can pray to anyone but God, and you can only pray to God through the Lord Jesus Christ, because he is our only mediator. I'm sure that there in heaven, Mary is grieved to see such things as uh, we're about to see today. She says, look to Christ. Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And that's what she would say to us today. Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. We have fellowship, we have taken the Lord's name, and the first God, and they have the right religion. Now they have the right God. Now we've got the truth of the Lord, and the Holy Ghost. The Muslim kills them! The Tibetan monks kill them! Right? Show me in the Bible where you should play, play with your feet! Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Although devotion to Mary is not laid down in the Bible, the Catholics, the teachings of their church carry as much authority. The church instructs that she cannot answer prayers herself, but because she is the mother of God, Mary is in a unique position to plead with her son to answer the prayers she hears. For these Protestants, the danger of Mary as an intercessor is that she is stealing the position that should be reserved for Jesus alone. Certainly, I think it's very easy to give to the mother of our Lord uh, a place which all of us would want to be reserved exclusively for Jesus. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is For me, the test is always whether your attitude to Mary points to Jesus and makes Jesus more interesting and more important, or whether it obscures Jesus. Our Lady of Walsingham, intercede with thy dear Son this day for those I love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I ask the intercessions of the person who looked after the Holy House at Nazareth for the support of my own family and friends. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour. Before I became an Orthodox Christian, um, I had been an Evangelical Anglican and, and didn't have a living relationship with the Mother of God. In fact, I opposed veneration of her, really, out of ignorance. But after a time, I realized that because the Orthodox Church is the Church of the Apostles, uh, continued uh, the teaching unchanged, that I had to be humble and realize, well, even though I don't understand entirely at this stage, veneration and the Mother of God, I must accept that what the Church teaches is correct. More honorable than the care of God. Certainly, I must say that by the grace of God, uh, the mother of God has become more and more special to me. What is important about the mother of God is that she shows us her son. That's what the icons show. They always point. The, the mother of God is always pointing to her son. And it's it's it's... It, it, it seems so wonderful that we have the gift of her, that she can help us um, to find Christ, who is sometimes when I'm praying, I think, 
you know, excuse me, Christ, I, I'm sorry I'm not praying to you because I find it much easier to pray to your mother. Um, but I, I don't actually think there's anything wrong in that. I think if you, you pray to her, who's the greatest intercessor of all, um, to help one, to find the Christ, as I said, that's within all of us. John Taverner's music is dominated by his orthodox faith and his particular devotion to Mary. The hymn to the Mother of God was written directly after my own mother's death. I remember going through a period where I didn't wish to write anymore. And after a while, um, music started to come to me, and it was a hymn to the Mother of God. And I don't think there's anything extraordinary about that. After all, my mother was my earthly mother, whom I, whom I used, abused, loved. And the mother of God, in the same way, someone one can use, abuse, and one loves. recent addition to the National Gallery in London is the Sainsbury Wing, especially designed to display the gallery's collection of early Renaissance paintings. Mary, the focus of many of these, has been the inspiration for artists throughout the centuries. But according to the gallery's director, Neil McGregor, she has become such a strong symbol of motherhood that even when artists are not intending to paint her, they cannot help but be influenced by the image. A particular shape, a particular group, a particular form becomes so associated with the virgin and child. The mother with child at her breast, uh, the isolated woman with child, we find it almost impossible not to read as a virgin and child. And if you look at a painting from the late years of Titian's life, so the, towards the end of the 16th century in Venice, you can see that Titian has actually presented a mother and child with no indications at all that they are anything other than a Venetian mother and child. I think it's fair to say that most of us looking at it, first of all, would imagine it has to be the Virgin and Christ. But on closer examination, again, I think we're meant to ask ourselves, is this actually Christ and the Virgin, or is it simply an ordinary mother and child? And there is, of course, a very real theological point in that as well, uh, the universality of Christ and of the Virgin, the fact that any human family can partake of their nature. I think there has been uh, a popular Mary uh, that uh, gives women uh, a way of uh, being able to intervene directly uh, with heaven, have a, a sympathetic 
figure that they can pray to who will understand their problems, understand uh, birth and the problems of women and so on. And some uh, <coughs> research that has been done on, uh, let's say, the understandings of Mary among uh, Italian working class women uh, is quite surprising that they have they have their own ideas about, about Mary. They think, well, Mary was really, you know, quite an independent businesswoman, and they, they insert ideas that belong to their own self-esteem, and are obviously not anything that they were taught from the pulpit. She's clearly a source of, of great solace. She's clearly more approachable. She becomes the intercessor. Um, so she's she's clearly a figure who who people feel can they can relate to. Um, I have a sort of personal sense, I suppose, only, and I'm just thinking about this now, is that people often say to me, um, it's easier to talk to a woman rabbi about emotional issues than it is to a male rabbi, not because male rabbis don't understand them, but because there is something inherently, um, or perceived, culturally perceived, to be, um, to be approachable in, in women. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mariana Lapini and her son Akim start every day with the Ave Maria, dedicated to Mary. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Akim and Patrick Kelleher both go to St. Charles Roman Catholic Primary School in London. Thank you. Holy water. For their mothers, Mary is a constant support in bringing up their children. Mrs. Alapini needed Mary's help most during the birth of her second child. She had a very traumatic birth and there was a lot of illness and uh, trauma surrounding that. And um, my faith really got me through that period of time. And being able to pray indirectly through the Virgin Mary to God, it did really make a very big difference to me because I felt that I had a bond with her, having gone through what I was going through and just thinking that she, her faith got her through a lot of different things that happened to Jesus. When I say to him, yeah, I feel it so I'm actually talking to someone and it just gives me a great sense of uh, relief, I just feel relieved and I do that um, you know, morning and night, and I just, I go to sleep quite happy. I feel as though I'm just having a conversation with someone. Among the many hymns the children of St. Charles's School sing about Mary, Bring Flowers of the Rarest celebrates the tradition that May is the month of Mary. Mary, we crown you with blossoms today, Queen of the Angels and Queen of the May. Mary's association with the month of May began when early Christianity absorbed the customs with which pagan religions celebrated the beginning of spring. Realizing that these spring fertility rites were popular, the church took the powerful figure at the center of these festivities, the earth goddess, and replaced her with its own more malleable leading lady, Mary. And her more docile image came to embody the ideal feminine virtues. It can be argued that to have a, a, a goddess like that is better than having no goddess at all. And I think that, that there are people who would say, you know, at least she is a woman. That's a bit like, you know, Mrs. Thatcher, at least she is a woman. I'm not sure, I mean, I take that point, but I, I'm, I think on, overall, it's, uh, you know, what, what Mary represents has been 
destructive in terms of women's own experiences and expectations and the, the task they face of making some sense of living in a male-dominated world and getting themselves together in the process. Right, ladies and gentlemen, now start the parade and first of all may I introduce the Devolves Community Association 1990 Fake Queen, Natalie. And their retinue, Emma, Carly, Samantha, and another Emma. Thank you. Every week throughout the spring, the Derbyshire Court of May Queens meets for a competition and for a crowning ceremony. In looking for the perfect May Queen, the judges are assessing the very qualities Mary has come to embody. Humility, obedience, dignity, beauty, purity, chastity, and modesty. My own experience was um, growing up in school, in a secondary school run by a religious order, and also at home, Mary was always held up as somebody who was meek and mild, and you know, so we spoke and she was spoken to, always looked well and demure and so on. And even you didn't whistle because Mary would cry if you whistled. When you look at how women have been treated, how, the, the ways in which they've been put on a pedestal throughout history, you can actually see very clear links between, on the one hand, this notion of women as superior in a, a strange way, and on the other hand, their treatment as, as people who are really not entitled to the same kinds of rights and responsibilities as, as, as men. Those links exist, and they are not helpful to women. Ladies and gentlemen, will you put your hands together for the Bowles Community Association, Fake Queen 1991, Amanda, and Princess Jane, Rosebrook Jenner, and the retinue Kirsty, Debbie, Gemma, and Charlotte. Thank you. Now I ask Natalie, to crown our new 1991 fake queen. If you hold up somebody as a perfect woman, a culture that is male-dominated will dump onto that woman all the things that they would like. Uh, women to be and then say you ought to be it because Mary was um, and they, uh, in that sense any woman is on a hiding to nothing since the one thing that Mary is held up for doing is being both a virgin and a mother and you're very unlikely to pull it off however hard you work. Father Guyver and Canon Wells from Middlesbrough are off to Portugal with their band of pilgrims in pursuit of the ultimate Mary experience. All over the world there are Marian hotspots where she is believed to have appeared in visions. Lourdes in France, Knock in Ireland, Guadeloupe in Mexico, Walsingham in England, Medjugorje in Yugoslavia and Fatima in Portugal are the most popular destinations on the international Mary circuit. First on their itinerary, Shopping for souvenirs in the Mary Market. Can we guess that one? Yeah. How much is it? How much? Well, I have one for Betty as well, you know. 420. So let's get What about the one for Betty? Should I get Betty get one as well? Yeah, I want the two, don't I? I want the two. Yes, yeah. so three. Three. Look, she's pretty. Jackpot. She's pretty. Oh, 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 Whatever sort of Mary the people want, it's all on offer here at Fatima. Well, they're much cheaper here than if you bought them in England. Yeah. Mary's strength has always been good marketing, and it continues to find favour with her followers today. Portuguese are very devout and very religious. And as time goes on, the place itself sort of grows on you. When you sort of arrive, it's so different from Walsingham and Lourdes. You sort of think, oh, you know, where have I landed? And then as time goes on, you feel the vibrations of the holiness coming on. They're giving thanks for some of the promises that were made to Our Lady at this place when she asked that people should pray for the conversion, particularly of Russia, we think about, and for 
a reconversion of the world. The first world war still followed. At Fatima, even the promises made by Mary have been turned into a tourist attraction. The Waxwork Museum tells the story of the six appearances she made in 1917. God's ambassador, the angel of peace, and the Virgin Mary, mother of God and the church, visited three children as they looked after their flocks, the three little shepherds, and brought to them a message of peace, hope, and love to spread amongst men. But she also brought dire warnings of hell if her requests were not obeyed. To put down the murmurs of disbelief, she promised to perform a miracle, but only after she had secured a niche for herself in Fatima. What do you want of me? I want to tell you that a chapel should be built here in my honor. That's how I am the Lady of the Rosary, and that you must continue to say the Rosary as on October the 13th, 1917, thousands of witnesses saw the sun spin on its axis. Mary had performed her miracle. October remains the high point in the Fatima calendar. Fatima represents the extremes of the Mary cult. Manipulation, marketing and glorious packaging that has taken an ordinary peasant mother, isolated her from her son and turned her into the Queen of Heaven. But it is still her consent which gave birth to the world's biggest religious movement, and she is the supreme fulfillment of the words of her own poem, the Magnificat. For in her, God really has exalted the humble and meek, and the fact that he has heaped the riches of salvation onto one of his disciples, however lowly and insignificant, allows Mary's followers to hope for similar rewards.
can come anytime. Anytime. Before 9 o'clock at night. Yeah. Who shall I ask for it? Well, no, they'll be expecting you. Alright, I'll come tomorrow, yeah. Alright, God loves you. Alright. God loves you. God bless you. The nuns run two homes for those they find in special need as they tour the streets. One for women and this one for men. Here they can offer medical treatment and help to overcome drink problems. But above all, their aim is to give them the love and care so lacking in their lives. For the sisters, the work is often hard and menial. We wouldn't be able to do that kind of work because we have really very heavy work to do if we didn't have a deep life of prayer, if we didn't have that refilling each time. Because we need about, we have about four, four hours of prayer every day. I believe in God. That's God. A number of the nuns working in London have been sent by Mother Teresa from India, including Sister Josanne, who is one of the superiors responsible for the missionaries' work in Europe. It is a hard life. I think God gives us the grace to be happy, and I think I am happy, and I see the sisters in my community in the region I visit are very happy and very sad. I say very clearly. Whatever you do to the least of my brethren, you do it to me. That is really Jesus in the distress in disguise. If you give a glass of water in my name, give it to me. If you receive a little child in my name, you shall receive me. Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. When the meal is over and the tables are set for the next day, the sisters and co-workers gather for a closing prayer. It's run for women in Kilburn. They bought this house several years ago with money donated to the order. Mother Teresa refuses to allow any fundraising, believing that God will provide and through generous donate work. They visit the old and lonely in their homes and make friends with families and local children. They walk everywhere saying the rosary. To begin with, it was tough going, getting to know the district. Children even threw stones at them, but gradually they became a familiar sight walking the streets and today regularly visit several hundred people. It's Mother Teresa's view that loneliness and poverty in the affluent parts of the world can only be tackled by strengthening families. And so the nuns are encouraged to visit and lend support to families in the district and spend time with the children. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The sister's work brings them into daily contact with people in need or in pain like Alice Tullock, who is crippled with arthritis. Mother Teresa believes that suffering need not be pointless and can be given purpose through prayer. Too ill to be actively involved, Alice writes to one of the superiors of the Missionaries of Charity in India. She supports her and her work, creating a link which Mother Teresa believes is very... The link involved is prayer. The link involved that you are a co-worker of Mother Teresa through prayer, through prayer, and suffering, of course. Suffering is a gift because it helps you to share the suffering of Christ. We share the suffering with you. So then, oh. very beautiful. I remember once I met a lady who was in an extraordinary pain of cancer, and I said to her, you know, this is by the kiss of Jesus, a sign that you have come so close to Jesus on the cross that he can kiss you. And then she joined her hand and said, Mother Teresa, please tell Jesus to stop kissing me. <laughs> I think she had a love kisses. <laughs> but it's very beautiful. Then the new life came into her life as she was something sharing with Jesus. I wonder, 
It's this new life and love which can come as a result of all suffering, which motivates the sisters. Every day they renew their closeness to the crucified Christ at adoration, when, in a practice familiar to many Roman Catholics, the consecrated bread from the Mass is displayed. They're not social workers, but contemplatives living in the world. They live a combined life of prayer and work. Obviously, not everyone can dedicate their entire lives in the same way. So what does Mother Teresa say to the thousands of people who team into London to work every day, who see some of the poverty and loneliness of the city, and yet pass by on the other side? I believe that you know, for our people here in, uh, in London, I, I want to say, I, I just a little, little note to say that I want to give them a gift. And this is a gift to our poor people, to do something beautiful for God through these people. Thank you.